Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. There's some faces I don't know. So my name is Dr. Rhys Jones. I'm a lecturer here uh, at the Cardiff School of Biosciences. I'm part of the Cripes group as well. So for those non-scientists, uh, that means that uh, I actually get to play with parasites all day and we have good fun with it indeed. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have been invited uh, to introduce Professor Robert Poulain here today. I know this is your only uh, visit outside of New Zealand, isn't it, this year, if I'm right? And you've come all the way to Wales, and your first visit to Wales. So, Chrysia Cymru, welcome to Wales. Uh, we are absolutely delighted you're here. Uh, it really is. Parasites, they're not an easy sell. We've got, uh, we've got, uh, there's, Mike Bruford was in here somewhere, you know, giant pandas, that's easy, isn't it? Giant pandas, big fluffy black and white things, they're easy. Bird people as well. Parasites is not the same thing. You start off, you've got all of your, you know, you start lecturing on your parasite lectures and everybody is really happy to begin with. And then you can see those, those sort of repulsed stares as you start to explain what a wonderful ecosystem you are for all these different lice on your eyelashes and the like. And then you see the sweaty palms and people start involuntary itching as well, all the way through. But you know what, that hasn't stopped uh, Robert at having an absolutely incredible uh, career in parasitology, an absolutely incredible one indeed. And I'm quite excited you're here because you and I obviously have something in common. Uh, and uh, I, I never thought I'd be able to do this in an introductory speech, of course. And that's the fact that we, we're both really, really interested in the parasites uh, of the rectums of reptiles, of course. Really, really interesting subject. I speak for hours on it. And uh, I, I'm probably being a little unfair here, aren't I? A little unfair. I've obviously worked on them. Uh, no surprise there. Um, but, you know, if you're absolutely at the top of your game if you've enjoyed the success of a very very uh, successful uh, academic career in the way that Ruben has uh, then it could be that uh, your peers decide uh, to name an animal after you something that they've discovered uh, we don't go uh, naming animals after ourselves obviously we discover a new species we don't name it after ourselves but certainly, if our peers are impressed enough with us, they will be. And that's exactly what happened to you, of course. 2003, two young uh, French parasitologists, I thought they were just coming down there, two young uh, French parasitologists uh, that actually discovered a new species of pinworm, I believe it was, uh, in the rectum of a tortoise in northern Africa. Um, uh, I, I don't know if it's good, but they immediately thought, we will name it after you, Robert. We will name it after you. No. <laughs> oh. But it's, um, it, it really is uh, quite an incredible career. We've been looking around at uh, some of the, the highlights of your career. I mean, that is obviously a highlight of your career. Anyone having uh, uh, any organism named after themselves is absolutely incredible. But I was looking at just how much you've published, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Six books, um, one of those, of course, uh, the author of six books, I should add. Uh, one of those, of course, the evolutionary ecology of parasites is a well, it's an in international standard text. Um, add to that twenty-five other chapters in other books, and of course, all of those book chapters have impacted on your ability uh, to publish peer-reviewed uh, journal articles. And of course, that's suffered badly because you've only managed to uh, produce, I think, it's four hundred and fifty uh, peer-reviewed articles as well, which made most of the academics in the room just wince. I can tell you. Um, I say 450-ish because obviously that was the count when we, we spoke last night, but of course <laughs> I've had breakfast this morning and uh, you probably could have published a few more by then. I love the fact you're all laughing. I was serious. Uh, so I, anyway, we've looked, uh, I was just looking back at exactly what you've produced. Obviously as a, as a PhD supervisor as well, uh, you've produced some fantastic uh, students. I'm very proud that we've managed uh, also uh, to be able to get one of those PhD students. We've managed to attract them over here to Colorado. I should say they qualified first of all, we didn't pinch her off you. Uh, so uh, qualified, she came over uh, and she now studies. We're very proud to have her here in our Krebs group as well, of course, Dr. Uh, Rachel Hassan, of course, who's down the front here. Uh, and Rachel and I and Amy and lots of the other Cripes research group, we all went out last night uh, for dinner with you and I was trying to uh, grab some sort of interesting uh, stories from you and the like and I think what was the really interesting thing was just how humble you were because there was a lot of people in the room 
I've turned up here today to go, wow, I really want to hear you speak and all these publications and everything else. And you explained to me that actually, you know, when it comes to parasitology, you were the accidental parasitologist. And it was so interesting listening to you when we walked home last night after, after dinner. And then you were explaining to me that actually in your undergraduate days, was that uh, McGill University uh, in Montreal, uh, that you were uh, not even interested in taking the parasite lectures, the modules, anything at all about them. Just not interested in parasites whatsoever. It was only during your postgraduate studies then um, that at the Université uh, Laval, is that right? Yes, in, in uh, um, Quebec City, isn't it? Uh, that was when you started to become interested in parasites. And again, totally accidentally, you were in aquatic biology. Aquatic biology, looking at fishes. And then one day he's looking at these fishes and they're, there's a little parasite, a little external parasite on those fish. And he went to his supervisor and he said, what do you want me to do about these? These are interesting, what about these? And the supervisor said, <laughs> parasites. Who's interested in parasites? Go and get some tweezers, pick those off, get rid of them, discard them. What possible use? We're all interested. Biomass. Biomass is what's important. Look at these fish, forget about these parasite things. They're of no interest whatsoever. And that's how it went on. Uh, Rugard did this. He got rid of uh, the parasites. But then on reintroducing those fish into the aquarium, he noticed that there were some changes, that those those little crustaceans on the outside of the fish, they had some type of biological influence. They were changing the behavior of those fish. So quite rightly, right at the beginning of his PhD, changed the focus of that PhD onto the parasites and away uh, from the fish. And we're very glad you did. And so started uh, an absolutely uh, glittering career. So then in 1992, you decided to, to emigrate over with your family, over to New Zealand, over to the University of Otago. Uh, so go Highlanders, go Highlanders. So, <laughs> <laughs> rugby jokes, don't worry. Uh, and uh, while you were over there, that's when you started, obviously, the Parasite Evolution and Ecology Group, and the rest is history, really. Um, but before I uh, hand over to Robert, I just wanted to give a nod to some of the extraordinary honours uh, and awards received by Robert over the years. I mean, uh, I was listing these to you because I know, obviously, the Royal Society uh, the New Zealand Royal Society made you a fellow in 2001, was it not? And I think the same year the Royal Society uh, of, Sci um, of Scientists as well, Association of Scientists, uh, they also, uh, you had their research medal. And then we had the Royal Society themselves giving you the, the very prestigious uh, James Cook Research Fellowship. And I think that was 2007, Parasitology section of the Canadian uh, Society of Zoologists, uh, actually giving you, uh, again, the Robert Arnold uh, Waddle Award. And then, of course, we've got the New Zealand Royal Society uh, giving you the Hutton Medal as well. It's an incredibly distinguished career. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you give a very warm Cardiff welcome to Professor Robert Poulain. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're very hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> it is indeed my first visit to Cardiff, and so far I'm really enjoying your city. The, even the weather is, is pretty much like the weather where I come from. Um, and I want to thank the NRN LCWE uh, for funding my visit. And I am indeed here to work on themes that touch the environment and aquaculture. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is actually uh, something that most people would rather not think about. And I want to talk about parasites. Oh, let me switch that. Do that. Yeah, there we go. Um, even professional parasitologists will be the first to recognize that the things they, stu they, they study are not particularly appealing to most people. And you can judge that from these opening sentences from a book written by parasitologists about parasites. The authors, of, the authors of this book say that uh, parasites are an unpleasant but unavoidable fact of life uh, to some people, but to others, they're like Victorian ankles, an embarrassing topic to be avoided in polite conversation. <laughs> now, even the word parasite itself has a very negative connotation, which goes back to its origin. It comes from a Greek word uh, that refers to an uninvited guest that sits at your table and eats your food. Now, that's not very nice. 
Um, and if I mention the word parasites to the people on the street in New Zealand, the first thing they will think of uh, is the poor sheep or cattle farmer trying to combat nematodes or intestinal roundworms that cause tens of millions of dollars in production losses every year using a range of drenches and other drugs. So clearly parasites are not popular. They have this, this negative connotation to them. And people have been very slow to warm up to their charms. And that is also true of scientists. For example, if you uh, just consider ecologists, the people who study environmental relationships between different species, they have long dismissed parasites as completely unimportant in ecosystems. <laughs> and this is despite the fact that we recognize now that maybe half of the species on Earth are parasites. And the reason why ecologists have long dismissed them has to do with their size. Now this graph represents the traditional view of most ecologists in terms of the importance of organisms to natural system versus their body mass. And it also, I put on the y-axis here, I could put amount of funding received, uh, or just, just general interest of people into organisms. It is proportional to body size. And unfortunately for parasites, they sit on the left-hand side of this, this graph. So they have traditionally received very little attention from ecologists. Of course, this is changing because in the last few years, uh, it has become very clear that parasites can punch well above their weight. <coughs> um, they, their impact on ecosystems is completely disproportionate to their actual body mass. And ecologists are slowly realizing this and incorporating them into their picture of the world. But it's not just ecologists who have traditionally ignored parasites. Evolutionary biologists have done the same thing. They have often treated parasites as completely uninteresting from an evolutionary perspective because they are degenerate organisms that uh, run counter to the progressive evolution of other organisms. And this is captured by these quotes taken <coughs> from vari various textbooks from the 20th century. <coughs> so the one at the top, for instance, gives credit to the vertebrates because they have almost completely avoided the dirty corners of parasitism and degeneracy. Credit the vertebrates, awesome. But more worrying for a parasitologist is the quote at the bottom, which comes from a textbook that for a few decades in the late 20th century was the leading textbook of parasitology. And the authors of this book say that parasites, as a whole, are good examples of the inexorable march of evolution into blind alleys. So clearly, that does not sound like they're very appealing for an evolutionary biologist. And it is true that parasites, after they made the transition to become parasites, have lost some of their morphological complexity. For instance, at the top, on the left, you have a normal snail, what you think of if I say snail. But on the right is also a snail or a gastropod. Um, but this one is parasitic inside sea urchins or starfish. It has lost all the hallmarks of a mollusk. No sensory organs, no shell. It is just a tube that absorbs food at one end and pumps out eggs at the other end. At the bottom on the left, you have a copepod, a small crustacean which uh, <coughs> is a major component of the zooplankton in the oceans and freshwaters of the world. But on the right, you have three other species of copepods, although they don't look much like copepods. These are parasit parasitic copepods found on fish or on invertebrates. And they too have lost all the characteristics of a copepod. No exoskeleton, no segmentation, no arti articulated limbs, um, no sensory structures. So yes, parasites have lost some morphological complexity during the course of the revolution. But I prefer to think of the evolution of parasites as a two-step process. A long time ago, when a free-living lineage became parasitic, yes, it is true that they lost some morphological complexity. In particular, they lost a lot of sensory structures. What good are eyes if you live in the dark intestines of a, of a mammal? No need for that. But as I see it, after this initial transition to <coughs> the dark side of parasitology, <laughs> parasites have evolved a range of new adaptations, very sophisticated adaptations tailored to their new mode of life. These may not necessarily be morphological adaptations, but they are nonetheless sophisticated uh, adaptations to the life as a parasite inside another organism. And tonight, I'd like to focus on 
some examples of the wonderful adaptations of parasites to their mode of life. But before I get to that, just a few words about these transitions from free living to parasitism, which I, that I've just referred to. How often have these taken place? Well, this graph here is a, a very summarized tree of life for all animals. So we have sponges at the top, uh, arthropods at the bottom, and the chordates to which we belong are somewhere in the upper half of the figure. And the numbers in parentheses shown on this graph uh, indicate the number of independent transitions from a free living existence to a parasitic mode of life that have occurred in each of these major phyla. Now you can see that these have been very common amongst arthropods, <coughs> but not so common amongst other groups. But if you add them up, you come up to the astonishing number of over 220 independent transitions from a free living existence to life as a parasite during the course of evolution. Now to that we could add all the plants and fungi and other organisms that have also made these transitions. So it is clear that becoming a parasite is a major evolutionary route that has been followed by multiple different lineages independently. Now if you think of all the other major transitions during the history of life, things like the colonization of land or the evolution of flesh, these have only occurred a few times, a handful of times in some cases. Nothing nearly as frequent as switching from being a free living organism to being a parasite. It is something that is obviously not a, 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 an option for a large organism like a whale, because there's nothing larger than a whale that a whale could exploit as a parasite. But for most small organisms, most lineages of small organisms, that transition to parasitism has been so frequent that given enough time, it's probably almost inevitable. Maybe just as inevitable as a, uh, as a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong slide. Um, <laughs> as inevitable <laughs> as this event. So from all these 200 plus transitions to life as a parasite, these have occurred in completely different organisms. But yet, after an organism becomes a parasite, it faces similar life, uh, similar selective pressures, whatever uh, taxonomic group it belongs to. So all parasites must uh, find the right balance between feeding on the host and keeping it alive long enough. Uh, they must avoid the host defense systems. They must find a way of getting out of the host and infecting another one, and so on. All parasites face these similar selective pressures. And these have led to what I consider to be uh, excellent examples of convergent evolution. So completely different lineages converging onto a, a similar set of, of traits or adaptations to be a parasite. If we uh, take the example of a, an evolutionary landscape, that is a common sort of metaphor that evolutionary, evolutionary biologists use to illustrate this, this phenomenon, of, uh, phenomenon of convergence, uh, let's consider this two-dimensional plane uh, where the two main axes represent all the possible values that two traits can take. So the plane, the two-dimensional plane, provides you with all possible combinations of trait values for those two traits. Now some combinations will be successful, they'll work well together and lead to a successful organism. So the third dimension here, the, the elevation above that, that, uh, that plane, is a measure of the fitness achieved by particular combinations. So we can see that in this hypothetical example, there are three peaks, three combination of trade values that lead to high, uh, high fitness. But the plains or the valleys, I should say, in between are a combination that lead to low fitness. So in this example, we would, ex we would expect organisms, whatever their origins, to converge and meet on the peaks and avoid the valleys where they would achieve low fitness. And therefore, we would expect similar adaptations or similar <coughs> combinations of traits to evolve in different lineages if they face the same selective pressures. Is this going to work? There we go. And after examining all possible sorts of parasites out there, I've concluded that there are only six ways to be a successful parasite. Six strategies of, of you know, six <coughs> parasitic strategies that are available to organisms. And they're represented by the colored boxes at the bottom here with their names in them. 
The names don't really matter. And there are many dichotomous ways, starting with a range of different traits, to arrive at these categories. For example, here, I use two particular traits. The first is the number of hosts needed by a parasite to complete one generation. It could be the number of host individuals or the number of host species. And the second trait I've looked at in there is what the parasites do to their host. How do they reduce its fitness, which ranges from no effect to maximum effect, like killing it, for instance. And using just these two traits, we can classify parasites into these six different parasitic strategies. And we could arrive at the same classification using other traits. So I just want to emphasize the fact that although there's a diverse range of taxonomic groups of parasites, in terms of what they do, they fall into a few categories only. And the one I want to discuss mostly tonight is that orange box, the fourth box, the, the fourth from the left, uh, the case of the, the trophically transmitted parasites. These are parasites that uh, always use at least two different host species in a particular sequence <coughs> in order to complete one generation. The transmission from one host to the next in these parasites always appear by predation. So the first host that the parasites <coughs> use when they're juvenile is eaten by the next host that they must infect and become and develop into adults. The transmission occurs by predation. These parasites share a bunch of other traits. I've mentioned a couple here, first of all, in terms of what happens to the host. Uh, the impact on the host might be very slight, but it will increase in proportion to the severity of infection. And typically, the impact is greater in the first host than in the second. Many, many different types of parasites coming from different origins have converged on this strategy. And they include all the common types of parasitic worms, such as the flukes or trematodes, the tapeworms or cestodes, uh, the nematodes or roundworms, and so on. And tonight I'll give you some examples of beautiful adaptations involving these parasites, in particular the trematodes or flukes. But before I get to them, I just want to say a few words about the life cycles of parasites. I've alluded here to the fact that they might use more than one host. Um, obviously, the simplest life cycle would involve a single host per generation. So presumably, the ancestral parasites in any lineage began with the simplest of life cycles. They live inside one host. They must pass out some transmission stages, eggs, spores, cysts depending on the type of parasites. And these must then infect another individual of that host species. The simplest of life cycle, the original one, no doubt, and one still used by many parasites today, including the nematodes that plague sheep and cattle, for instance. In many other parasite lineages, a second host was added to the life cycle. So that now we have life cycles that look like this, where again, the adult parasites live in a host, their dispersal stages are released from the host, but in this case, they end up infecting an intermediate host in which they will develop to a juvenile stage. And their transmission to the final host that they must reach in order to complete the life cycle occurs by predation. Many parasitic worms use this sort of life cycle. And basically, their reliance on, on predation means that every time you walk in nature and you see uh, an act of predation, such as a, a heron feeding on a fish, your eyes are seeing predation. But what you're not seeing is the multiple parasites in that fish being simultaneously transmitted to the heron. The eye misses that, but it's actually happening. And there's a more complicated type of life cycle that is typical of most, but not all, but, but most trematodes or and this one involves three different host species that must be visited in a particular order. So basically, trematodes have added uh, an additional host in between the final host where the adults live and the uh, second intermediate host. And this first host is almost always a snail. The eggs or the, the larvae issued from the eggs that are released by the first host, or the, sorry, the, the final host, must infect that snail. They castrate the snail and divert all the energy that the snail will normally use for reproduction into their own reproduction, the parasite's own multiplication. So they multiply asexually within that snail, producing large numbers of genetically identical clones, which will then leave the snail as little larvae to find the next host in the life cycle. 
So essentially, they transformed that snail into a factory whose sole objective is to produce multiple identical copies of the parasites. And they can produce, depending on the parasite species, anywhere from a few thousands to several hundreds of thousands of copies of dead cells in the lifetime of that colony. And this is, like I said, a typical life cycle for trematodes. Now, in themselves, these complex life cycles indicate that parasites are not such degenerate, such simplified organisms. They actually live pretty complex lives. But the adaptations I want to discuss for the rest of the talks are actually even more amazing. The first is that despite their lack of sensory structures and the fact that they live inside another animal, Many parasites can actually pick up some cues of the external world and adjust what they do based on those external conditions, which is quite remarkable. Even more remarkable, some parasites have developed something that we normally only associate with insects like bees and ants and termites. They have evolved division of labor amongst individuals to maximize their production of dispersal stages. That's amazing. And perhaps the most talked about adaptation of parasites, the one that the, the media like to seize upon, is the ability of parasites to take over uh, the control of their host behavior. Pull all the strings and make the host do what the parasite wants it to do, turn it into a little puppet. So I'm going to give you examples of these, just to show you that parasites are actually awesome creatures. First of all, about this awareness of the outside world. Just remember for a Second, what I said about the life cycle of trematodes, the three hosts are needed to complete the life cycle, where at some point the parasite will sit inside one host and require it to be eaten by the next host. <coughs> what if the next host is not around? What if there is a shortage of that definitive host? Now, if the parasite doesn't know that and, and can't do anything about it, it will just die without ever reaching adulthood. But what if the parasite could find out somehow whether or not there are uh, that, that definitive host, that final host is available outside? Could the parasite then adjust what it does in consequence? Well, consider this example from a parasite from New Zealand fish. It's a little trematode that lives in the gut of fish where the different worms find each other, they mate, they reproduce sexually, the eggs of the parasite pass out in the fish feces, they will infect a snail, transform it into a factory where they multiply asexually, and the little larvae they produce then leave the snail to infect a small crustacean where they insist and they await being ingested by a fish. This is what they look like when, they, when they're in the crustacean. They just curl up into a little ball, into that little cyst that looks more like a little thin envelope. Now in the same populations of this parasite, we find some that do something completely different. Instead of remaining small at the juvenile stage inside the crustacean, they become precociously sexually mature. They just keep growing. They reach adult size. They really distend the little cyst in which they are. They may be sexually mature, but there's still one of them persists. So how do they reproduce? Well, trematodes are uh, hermaphrodites. They possess both male and female sexual organs, so they can actually produce eggs and fertilize them. And you can see that this guy is slowly filling its cyst with its own eggs. The large size of this parasite is also precipitating the death of the small crustacean, which allows the eggs to be released into the water and infect the snail directly. This, this life cycle bypasses the need to go to a fish. These parasites can complete their life cycle in the total absence of fish. So is this why some of them do it? Is it because they noticed that there were too few fish around? and they decided to skip the fish? Well, we tested this by doing a very simple experiment in which we uh, exposed the crustaceans to the parasites in very small volumes of water to force the infection. We did this to hundreds and hundreds of these little crustaceans, and then we split them into two treatments. Some of them were reared in water that was just plain water, Whereas the rest were uh, raised in water uh, that smelled of fish. We simply used water from a fish tank and on at the, every, every few days added the fish smelling water to the, the tanks containing these little crustaceans. We kept this up for several weeks and then we dissected the crustaceans to see what did the parasites do inside them. These are all parasites that arrive in the crustacean at the same time, we find the infection 
So what happened to them? What did they do? Well, this figure summarizes what happened. You can see that the uh, crustaceans, um, I'm sorry, the parasites that were reared in crust uh, that, that were in crustaceans reared in water that did not smell like fish. Uh, practically all of them, what is it, 92% of them adopted the longer life cycle that requires going to a fish. They remained at the juvenile stage inside the crustacean. But the ones that were uh, in amphipods raised in water that smelled like fish, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite, that did not, did I get this wrong? The top one, fish smell, most of them adopt the long cycle. The bottom one, control water, no fish smell, 80% of them adopt the short cycle that bypasses the fish. They become precociously mature, don't wait for the fish. So it looks like they adopt the life cycle that is the best uh, fit to the immediate external condition. And yet we're talking about little worms that are not only <coughs> inside another animal, but inside the little cyst, and they have no sensory structures. How could they know what's going on outside and adjust what they do to match that? Well, most likely, they pick up cues from the little crustacean itself. The crustaceans, under uh, conditions of fish smell, are very stressed by the presence of a predator. And the parasites inside those little crustaceans probably pick up on physiological changes that tell them, well, my host is very stressed. There must be fish around. I'll develop this way. Or my host is pretty relaxed, pretty <coughs> chill. There must be no fish around. I'll develop this way instead. And this is just one of many examples of parasites that use in direct ways to obtain information about the outside world and adjust what they actually do inside their host, which is, as I said before, quite <coughs> remarkable for little degenerate worms with no sensory structures. Perhaps even more remarkable is my second example, which involves parasites that use division of labor. Now, if I say division of labor in the animal kingdom, most of you will think of social insects, where we find morphologically distinct castes that perform different functions for the colony. So among these ants, you have workers and soldiers, for instance. You find the same in, in other groups of insects, like termites. Again, morphologically distinct castes performing different tasks for the colony. Well, we find that this is also happening in some trematodes. Remember the life cycle of trematodes focused in particular on the factory part of the life cycle. These parasites are inside the snail. They castrate the snail. You have what an infected snail looks like compared to a healthy snail. All the white stuff there is gonads of the snail. But in an infected one, this disappears and the parasite takes over that portion of the snail. So all the orange mass there is not just a big blob. It's multiple little individual parasites living packed together in a colony where all the members are clones. They're all genetically identical. Now, if in one of our factories, in our industrial societies, we have long discovered that division of labor with each worker specializing on a different task is the best way to maximize output, we should expect that natural selection would also hit upon that strategy. <laughs> and indeed, we find that in several species of trematodes, this is exactly what's happening. And remember that these, the members of these colonies are clones. So clearly, what benefits one of them is the same thing as what benefits the colony. They're all genetically the same. So a few years ago, one of my students, uh, Tommy Leung, and uh, independently a group working in California, who discovered the existence of division of labor in uh, the colonies of these trematodes within their snail host. Now, this is an example here that the large individual uh, is filled with the transmis transmission stages or offspring of the colony. It's quite large. And traditionally, it was thought that the smaller individuals seen in these colonies were simply young ones that were going to grow into that one day and become reproductives as well. But what Tommy, my student, and the Californian researchers found out is that these little guys, they never grow up. They never reproduce. They are a morphologically distinct caste. And I'm calling them here the reproductive caste and the defensive or soldier caste for obvious reasons, because these smaller guys, their function is to defend the colony against other trematodes that may try to establish their own colony in the same snap. The little soldiers will just latch on to these invaders. They will pierce their outside and just suck their contents. 
killing them, it takes several minutes to kill them. But that's the role. These guys are specialized soldiers. This is another species. This is actually the species we work on. Again, you, you can see the large reproductive at the top, the smaller soldier at the bottom. You can see that the smaller soldier is actually smaller than one of the offspring produced by the large reproductive. So they're very small. But like I said, they latch on to a competitor and they eventually kill it. This little video actually shows a soldier attached to another trematode species, a member of another trematode species that tries to build its own colony within the snail. And you can see the pumping motion, the contractions, uh, whereby the little uh, soldier is trying to kill this guy. And that can take several minutes, but death is inevitable. The soldiers are really, really good. So this has now been reported in almost 20 different species. It is suspected to happen in many more but we have solid evidence from, for somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, different species. And in all cases, the division of labor includes these two castes that are always showing the same characteristics. You have the large reproductives, the little soldiers that can reproduce. Uh, for their size, the reproductives have a little pharynx, whereas the soldiers, for their size, have a huge muscular pharynx capable of good suction. Uh, the reproductives are typically motionless, whereas the little soldiers have little locomotory appendages and they're super mobile. They just <coughs> move around the colony all the time. The large reproductives can make contact and attack uh, other uh, species of trematodes or some competitors, but they rarely do so, whereas the little soldiers do this all the time. And finally, uh, if you look at where they are in the snail, the reproductives tend to be at the back of the colony, away from the entrance of the snail, whereas the little soldiers are much more common at the invasion front, near the entrance, where other trematodes might try to get in. So they're well deployed to play a good defensive role. Now in itself, this division of labor is remarkable for these tiny degenerate organisms with no sensory organs. But they actually do more than just have division of labor. They show the same sort of plasticity that we observe in ants or bees or termites. For instance, we wanted to know whether the caste ratio in the colony could adjust if the conditions change. By caste ratio, I mean the number of individuals in the soldier caste relative to their reproductive caste. The prediction here would be that if the colony is facing invasion by another competitor parasite, it should raise an army. The number of soldiers should increase relative to the number of reproductive if the colony needs defense. So we actually tested this by, first of all, uh, obtaining a large number of snails infected with our trematode, our model species of trematode with division of labor. These were kept in different containers and they were exposed to a gradient uh, ranging from zero risk of invasion by a competitor to a high risk of invasion. And the competitor we used is just another trematode species that are very common in our system. It uses seagulls as its definitive host, which means that parasites reproduce sexually in the seagull. The eggs of the parasite pass out in seagull feces. Uh, therefore, by obtaining seagull feces, we obtain a regular source of eggs from that competitor species. So I was going to say we collected uh, this is the royal we, my associates, collected <laughs> seagull food every week. Um, we always use the royal we. Um, so it's a very glamorous thing to be a parasitologist. So you just go out there every week, collect seagull poo, and then we prepare the solution that we could then dilute. And on the left, you have a control solution which contains zero poo and therefore zero eggs and therefore zero chance that the colonies of our model uh, or they, or our model trematode get invaded by a competitor. And as we shift <coughs> to the right, we have increasing concentrations of poo and therefore <coughs> eggs, and therefore an increasing risk uh, that the competitor will invade the snail and compete with our model parasite. So we kept this up for a year, and at the end of the year, we dissected <coughs> the snails and we looked at the composition of the colonies. So here we have the cast ratio, the soldiers, relative to reproductives as a function of the different levels of exposure. And that figure suggests that the caste ratio increases with increasing risk of competition. This seems to make sense. But the thing is that those uh, snails that were exposed to the competitor did not all become infected. Some do and some don't in a situation 
So if we split them up into those that became invaded by the competitor and those that did not, then we find a different pattern. If you look at the gray bars first, these are uh, the results for the snails that were never invaded by a competitor. You can see that the gas ratio remained the same across treatment. So that tells us that the parasites inside the snail do not react to the possibility of competition. However, we can see that they react to actual competition if you look at the white bars. These are the data for the snails that were actually invaded by the competitor. And what did they do in response to <coughs> another primate trying to establish its colony in the same snail? Well, they raised an army. They produced a surplus of soldiers which I don't have the slide showing that, but these soldiers actually reduce the size of the competitor's colony. So we can conclude that, yes, the parasites uh, with this division of labor are capable of adjusting the cast ratios of their colony over time to respond to the threat of competition. Obviously, adjusting cast ratios takes time. Um, it requires the replacement of individuals and this this slow turnover can take several weeks. Can these colonies also adjust to you know, much more quickly to changing conditions? Well, for this, it would require, should I, should I press on something here? It will go, there we go. Um, this would require, th these rapid responses would require some plasticity on the part of individuals belonging to the different castes. For instance, could members of one caste by uh, detecting a shortage of the other caste, could they pick up some of the duties of the other caste and therefore perform multiple functions? For instance, if there's a shortage of soldiers, can the reproductives pick up the arms and defend the colony? Can they do that in very, as a very short-term response? Well, to test this, we developed an in vitro culture system uh, which allows us to take parasites outside of their snail host and maintain them alive for up to three months. So we keep them in culture plates, each little well being filled with the culture medium. We then extract the parasites from the snails, and we create smaller or mini colonies where we can manipulate the ratio of soldiers to reproductives. We can do this from multiple snails to not only have replication, but also to test whether there are genetic differences between these different clonal colonies. And in this uh, experiment, the one that's shown here, we uh, have many colonies that always had six reproductives. But the number of individuals vary amongst treatment from very few, only two, to a great surplus of soldiers, 18 soldiers for six reproductives. And all these mini colonies were maintained in the presence of the competitor, shown here in, I was going to say red, it could be orange, whatever. Um, and we kept those for uh, multiple days, and at regular interval, we filmed these uh, little wells with the colonies to record the behavior of the reproductives and see whether they actually performed some attacks on the competitor and whether their rates of attack were proportional to how many soldiers there were in their colony. So what we found is summarized here. Uh, you have the proportion of time out of all the video footage that the reproductives spent attacking competitors in the three different treatments with the different gas ratios. So if you look to the right-hand side first, uh, this is the situation where the colony is very well equipped with many soldiers. There's a big army around. And you can see that in this situation, the reproductives, the reproductives spend only a small proportion of their time trying to attack the competitors. But as we move to the left, and we, we decrease the number of soldiers, you can see that the reproductives actually increase the amount of time they spend defending the colony. So in, 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 in reply to the question I asked before, it does look that at least one caste has the ability to pick up the slack and, and perform some of the functions of the other caste if a shortage of that other caste exists. So these are the sorts of things that ants or bees or termites in their colonies do. But it's quite remarkable to find that these diminutive uh, sensory organ-less parasites are capable of doing the same thing and matching bees and ant colonies. But let me move on to the last example of the wonderful things that parasites do. And this is their ability to 
manipulate the behavior of their host or alter the appearance of the host so that uh, the host does or looks like uh, something that would benefit the parasite. Just go, going back to the two life cycles I've mentioned before that require this transmission by predation, this means that when it's a, a juvenile, the parasite sits in a prey organism, but it must reach the predator to complete its development. Now, prey animals have evolved a range of anti-predator uh, uh, adaptations, whether it's camouflage or behavioral adaptations. They don't want to be eaten, and natural selection has given them a range of anti-predator abilities. That's not good news for the parasites, because they want predation to happen. So imagine that there is some sort of a mutant parasite that is somehow capable of altering the appearance or the behavior of this host to make it more likely to be eaten by the next host. Natural selection would favor that parasite. It would do better than the others. Its genes would spread. And eventually, we would have a, a species of parasites all capable of altering host behavior or appearance. And we've now, uh, I think the literature now in probably has examples of maybe 500. It's several hundred different cases of parasites capable of manipulating host behavior or appearance. And the number is growing all the time. And these provide us excellent examples of the concept of the extended phenotype, whereby genes inside one organism, in this case the parasite, have a phenotypic effect on the appearance or behavior of another organism, in this case the host. Let me give you some examples of this phenomenon. Let's begin with this little nematode parasite that must be transmitted from an ant to a bird. The problem for this little parasite is that the birds that are suitable for its development don't feed on ants. They feed on small fruits. So what has the parasite does? What has the parasite done? Well, it transforms the rear end of ants from its normal black coloration to a bright red color, but it also modifies the behavior of the ants. It causes them to go and perch amongst patches of little red berries for hours and hours at a time. Can you pick out which of these berries is not a berry? I'm sure you can, but it's not that obvious. And you can easily see how a bird could be fooled into eating that little red structure, thinking it's a fruit, but it's actually a package of little worms that would infect it. Consider this other, probably even more remarkable example of another parasite, this time a trematode, which must be transmitted again by predation from a snail to a bird. Now this is a trematode, so like other trematodes, it transforms the snail into a factory, it multiplies it sexually into these sacs, like I've shown you before, these sausage-shaped sacs, full of little dispersal stages. But in this case, instead of leaving the snail, they remain within the sacs, and they await for the snail to be eaten. Again, this parasite faces a problem in that the suitable next hosts for its development don't feed on snails, but they feed on caterpillars. So what does the parasite do? Well, these large sacs filled up with transmission stages force their way into the tentacles of the snail. They cause them to become distended and also transparent to the point that we can see those parasite sacs inside and these are banded with bright colors. But more than that, the parasite is capable of, and oh, <coughs> did you show? There we go, whoops, let me go back one. They, and again, another one. That video should work, there we go. The parasites are capable of contraction that also give them the appearance of being moving. So when you look at the color, the movement, the size of these tentacles, it's not surprising that birds think of them as nice, juicy caterpillars instead. So these are spectacular examples of parasites that can change the appearance of their host. And it's almost unquestionable that this benefits them and that this must be an adaptation. It's, it fits too well with what they need to happen for this to be a coincidence. But most other cases of parasite manipulation of their host behavior involves less spectacular uh, examples. Um, and sometimes one could argue that, well, it's not really that the parasite is doing something. It's just that the parasite is at the right place for something to happen. It's a fortuitous uh, coincidence that the parasite benefits <coughs> from this. 
For example, consider the, the, this example of a, a parasite from the New Zealand intertidal systems that we've been studying for years. Again, it's a trematode. Uh, the adults live in birds, reproduce sexually in birds, their eggs pass out, infect the snail. There's this factory happening again, which where they multiply asexually. The little larvae that leave the snails then swim around until they are sucked into the inhalant siphon of a cockle. They insist in the muscles of the cockle, awaiting ingestion by an oyster catcher. Now, they don't insist anywhere in any muscle. They insist only in the foot. The foot is that muscles that bivalves use to burrow into the sediment, to hide from predation, amongst other things. And the parasites can accumulate there in large numbers. But they don't go anywhere in the foot. They really like the tip of the foot. And we've shown that insisting in the tip of that foot impairs the ability of the cockle to burrow. So that we end up in the natural <coughs> population with a mixture of cockles. The ones with few or no parasites carry on with the normal burrowing behavior and they hide below the surface. But the ones that have accumulated lots of parasites in the tip of their foot are incapable of burrowing. They remain at the surface, sometimes just lying on their sides. And we've shown using two different field uh, experiments that cockles lying at the surface <coughs> are approximately seven times more likely to be eaten by a bird, a nicer catcher, uh, than uh, cockles that are burrowed under the sediment surface. So this benefits the parasite, but one could argue that it is a fortuitous benefit uh, that is a consequence of where they happen to insist in, in the cockle. I would argue that there's lots of other muscle tissue where they could insist. So why do they go specifically to the tip of the foot? Couldn't it be that they're selected to go there to impair burrowing? Let me give you another example along those lines, but one that is even more convincing. This one involves another New Zealand trematode. This one lives in the crested green. Same thing, its eggs pass out, infect the snail, multiply sexually in the snail, little larvae leave the snail, infect the fish, and they await for that fish to be ingested back by a grebe for the life cycle to be completed. Now here I have to do something. Which computer do I use? This one? There we go. I'm about to show you a little video that was filmed by Isabel Blasco Costa, who's sitting right there in the audience. It will give you an idea of what this parasite does. Because the parasite is not just anywhere in the fish. It goes in the eyes of the fish. So let's have a look at, uh, where do I click on this? I'm a Mac person. There we go. You should be able to see the parasite moving inside the eye of the fish. Can you see that? Really gross, eh? But the two things I want you to take from this video, first of all, is uh, the size of the parasite relative to the eyes. It's not trivial. It's a huge worm. And the other thing to notice is its movement. It's really active. It doesn't just sit there. It's actually moving around. Now, that is one worm in the eye. Imagine if a fish had multiple of these. For instance, and what do I need to do now? I need to stop this. And there we go. This is a cross section of an eye. You can see the lens, a little sphere. You can see the dark retina at the back. And you can see that the cross section went through five different worms. That's a lot of worms in one eye. But actually, some fish have over 20 of these worms per eye. So infections can be quite intense. And it's easy to imagine that the parasites just by being in the eye would impair vision by obstructing the retina, for instance. So to test whether they are just doing this by chance or whether the parasites are doing more than being there but actually adjusting their behavior to maximize obstruction, one of my students set up several cameras to film uh, the retina from several angles to go past the lens and see at the back to see how much of the retina was obstructed. So he videotaped the retina, and the images in the middle are just a composite of uh, the percentage of time uh, across the video footage that each pixel or each part of the retina was obstructed by the parasite. So a light coloration indicates very little obstruction. A dark color indicates very, uh, very, uh, very frequent obstruction of that part of the retina. So the top image comes from fish that were anesthetized and had their eyes videotaped in the morning. And in the morning, at any point in time, 
on average, 75% of the retina is obstructed by at least one worm. The same fish, again videotaped in the afternoon, <coughs> showed that only 30% of the retina is obstructed. Now, it turns out that the birds that are the definitive host of the parasites feed exclusively in the morning. They don't feed in the afternoon. So here we have a case of the parasites not only being in the right organ, but also adjusting their behavior to obstruct vision at the right time when the fish is experiencing predation risk. But at the rest, <coughs> uh, during the rest of the day, they move to the side and they allow the fish to see a bit more when there is no chance that they're going to be eaten by a, a bird anyway. So this suggests that it's not just that they're by chance in the right place. They've actually been selected to actively move around and obstruct visibility or vision when uh, it's most likely to pay off for them. And I just want to finish with what is probably the most remarkable example of manipulation, at least in my view. And it's something that has evolved remarkably independently in two completely different groups of parasites. The first group are what we call uh, nematomorphs or airworms. These are relatively large <coughs> worms that you find in terrestrial insects like beetles and grasshoppers and crickets. Uh, did I say they're large? Yes, they're huge. Um, and they grow to this large size over many, many months inside their terrestrial insect host. And when they're finished growing, they must come out because uh, they live a very short adult life outside the host during which they find a mate, reproduce, lay their eggs and die. But that life must be spent in water. So these guys live in a terrestrial insect, but can only survive if when they come out of the insect, they are in an open water body. So what they do is that they induce a totally remarkable suicidal behavior in their insect host. They induce water seeking, so the insects start looking for water, and they then force the, the host to jump in water. This is an abnormal behavior, not part of the behavioral repertoire of these terrestrial insects. And if you salvage the cricket, put it back on the side of the swimming pool, it will jump right back. They are driven to do this. And once this happens, and you can see the worm is now exiting the host, the host will be kicking its legs around. It looks very vigorous, but it's actually, it's actually dead. Um, you can imagine that the size of that worm has caused significant damage inside. The worm just keeps the host alive long enough to finish their development. And when they're finished with the development, they then induce this suicidal behavior. And when that's done, uh, they leave the dead carcass of the host behind. This poor worm is a bit stiff. It's going to loosen up. And when it's loose, it's going to swim much better than it is now and going to go look for a mate and mate. Remarkable, right? But what's even more remarkable is that this has evolved in a completely different group of parasites. The ones I just talked about in the previous slide are nematomorphs, that's a, a, a separate phylum of the animal kingdom. But within the nematodes or roundworms, another phylum, there's a family known as the, Vermi the Vermitidae, which has evolved the same life cycle. They also exploit terrestrial or semi-terrestrial arthropods, like this sand upper or this earwig. They also grow to extremely large sizes inside their host. They also must exit the host into water, water or water-saturated soil or sand. And they also induce the same water-seeking and suicidal behavior in their host. So this has evolved independently in these two different groups of parasites. How do they do this? We don't have a clue. However, we've just written, this is good, when you don't know something, you can ask for money to test it. So <laughs> a colleague and I at my university have just received a, a large grant to use transcriptomic epigenetic approaches, which, in other words, just looking at uh, gene expression in these uh, infected versus uninfected uh, uh, crickets and, and earwigs and sand offers, to determine whether the parasite is capable of turning on or turning off the expressions of certain genes at certain points in its development so that uh, these genes that are turned on and or turned off in the host will induce this weird behavior of looking for water and jumping into it. We don't have the results yet. Our, uh, our hypothesis is that the uh, gene expression changes uh, that are induced by the nematomorphs 
will probably be similar to those induced by the myrmidid nematodes. We expect that not only <coughs> the overall behavioral change has converged to be similar, but the mechanisms underlying the behavioral change are probably also similar. Why would uh, different sorts of pathways have evolved for this? So like I said, we don't have the results yet for this, but whatever they are, I'm sure it's going to be pretty interesting because we'll finally have uh, maybe the full picture of the mechanisms by which parasites induce these spectacular behavioral changes. So I'll stop here because I, I could go on and on and on about parasites and bore you to death. Um, but I just want to finish by going back to that quote I showed at the beginning, which is from the, the opening paragraph of a book on parasites, where the authors first said that and recognized that, yes, parasites are an embarrassing topic that is best avoided. But then they go on to say that to a small subset of human beings, parasites are glorious creatures, no less a part of Darwin's tangled bank than organisms that are more acceptable to our human taste. Well, I belong to that small subset of human beings, obviously. Um, I suspect I did not convince or, or convert any of you tonight to, to join that small subset. But at least I hope I've, I've convinced you that parasites are not just degenerate little worms that cause disease, but they actually have a fascinating biology and remarkable adaptations, <coughs> very sophisticated adaptations, that are worthy of study uh, for their own sake. So on this, thank you very much.